Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Missy Ryan, national security reporter for the Washington Post. I'm thrilled to be joined here today by Mikko Hautala, Finland's ambassador to the United States. Previously, Ambassador Hautala served as Finland's ambassador in Moscow and also as senior foreign policy advisor to Finnish President Sauli Ministo. In those capacities, Ambassador Hautala has met numerous times with Russian President Vladimir Putin. For that reason and many others, we are grateful to have him here today. Ambassador Hautala, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, let's get right into it. Finland is the only non-NATO member EU country to share a long border to share a border with Russia. A recent public opinion poll in Finland showed that 62% of people now support joining the NATO alliance. It's a big shift from years past. How will Finland approach the decision about whether to join NATO or not? And how does Finland's own history, especially the 1939 Winter War with the Soviet Union, inform the Finnish perspective on NATO? Thanks. Um, as you correctly pointed out, uh, there's been a clear uptick in the NATO support among the Finnish public. And I think, uh, as we have seen, uh, it's been totally uh, caused by the Russia's illegal and uh, unprovoked uh, invasion of Ukraine. So uh, I think uh, it's a major shift in how we see the situation. And I think uh, what we are now doing uh, is that we have a parliamentary process, which is government led. We are preparing assessment uh, on the situation and its uh, consequences uh, on our foreign policy environment. We expect that this discussion takes place in the next coming months. Uh, so it's really active. And I think uh, when I look down the road, uh, I think we are going to see some situations when we when we will have um, a rather clear idea how to continue further. So there is a clear shift in the public opinion and also uh, the government that the president are reacting into the situation by by really deepening the discussion on, on, on what to do next. You mentioned the, the winter war. I think uh, what we've seen so far in Ukraine uh, to some extent, it resembles the winter war scenario, because also in our case, uh, the attack by the Soviet Union then was totally unprovoked. It was illegal and, and actually Soviet Union was kicked out of the League of Nations immediately following the attack. So there was a global uh, uh, condemnation of the attack also at that point. And actually Finland got a lot of uh, global support after a while when every people saw that the Finnish defense is actually capable, uh, not only sort of uh, uh, fighting, but also actually uh, slowing down and, and even stopping the enemy. So there are a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, similar points in this history. And, and of course, uh, for us, for Finns, uh, we understand the reasons why Ukra Ukrainians are fighting so hard. It's their land. Uh, they have absolutely nowhere to go if they lose it. Uh, so uh, it motivates them and it, it's totally clear uh, to us. No, it's a fascinating parallel. Uh, Ambassador, I'm going to read a question from an audience member. We have a question here from Spencer Myers in California who asked, what is the biggest hurdle to Finland joining NATO? What would be your answer to that, Ambassador? I think we need, um, first of all, we need to have a kind of a full understanding uh, domestically among the uh, political decision makers uh, what are the different factors uh, uh, that, that sort of uh, influence on the decision? Obviously, uh, there is this na national mood, public opinion that is still evolving. And of course, uh, we also have to see uh, what is the environment uh, among the friends, among our partners and friends like, uh, like European countries, the US. What is the sort of the situation and how do those countries which are already uh, NATO members, uh, how do they see the situation? Then, of course, um, uh, like in the past, we have been coordinating and cooperating really closely with Sweden. Uh, we used to be part of the same country uh, for many hundred years. And, and obviously, Sweden is a close partner to us, which has the same kind of position. We are part of the EU, but we are not, and we are not neutral in that sense, but we don't belong to any military alliances. And obviously, there is a need, given the similar uh, geostrategic location, there's a 
good reasons for us to coordinate closely how these decisions uh, will be taken and, and what kind of decisions down the road uh, we will have. So would you expect that a decision would be taken together if uh, Finland and Sweden were to join the alliance? Would you expect that they would um, do so in unison? I think um, obviously each country is, a, is an independent state, so I don't see that uh, these decisions will be kind of a jointly made, uh, whatever, whatever they will be. But I expect a close coordination, a close understanding on both sides of the Gulf of Finland, that how this, uh, what kind of decisions the other is is, is making. Uh, so I, ant I anticipate a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, communication across the sea. All right, I have a few more questions on NATO before we move on to, to Russia. Uh, Russia recently threatened Finland with, I, I think it was military and technical consequences if it were to join NATO. And I know that it's not the first time that Russia has made that kind of threat. But what should we make of that? It seemed pretty ominous in light of the fact that Russia had used those very same words prior to their invasion of Ukraine last month. I think they have used uh, a bit different words in case of Ukraine. I think for Finland, uh, these are basically the same words they've been using for many, many years, um, uh, even decades. So I think the, the response on the Russian side has always been that they would see it as a negative trend and negative um, uh, developments in the Northern Europe. And they've always said that they would have to then uh, increase the level of their military presence close to our border. And they would also have to bring uh, a number of uh, uh, sort of highly developed weapon systems uh, to the proximity with Finland. So this is how I read the, um, how I read the comment. But I don't really see anything, uh, anything substantially new um, uh, in it. Can you talk about Finland's uh, own defense posture as a non-NATO state? I think it's something that most Americans don't know very much about. And I know that Finland is now finalizing or has finalized the purchase of 64 F-35s, which is a big deal. What can you tell uh, an American audience and a global audience about Finland's ability to de defend itself? I think it's important to understand that Finland actually never let his guard down. So even after the Cold War, uh, when basically many nations were enjoying the peace dividend, they were kind of a, uh, actually saving from the military expenses and so on. Finland kept uh, steady. Uh, we always maintained armed forces, which are designed for uh, 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 really serious scenarios uh, involved uh, uh, involving fighting against with the bigger opponent. So we have never kind of believed or, or sort of uh, expected that the situation that we had until uh, until last couple of years that that would be necessarily a, a permanent one. So we've been uh, getting ready for this. Uh, we have a large reserve. Uh, we have uh, actually one of the most capable armed forces in Europe. Uh, certainly, if you if you take into account the, the number of population, which is 5.5 million, we have uh, 280,000 uh, uh, strength of the army. Then we have uh, roughly 900,000 trained men and women. So it's a large reserve force. Then air defense, you mentioned um, 64 F-35s. Uh, that decision that we took in December, uh, we didn't uh, take it because of the situation in Ukraine, but simply because we had to renew the fleet of F-18s that we are still using. So we had to renew the fleet and we wanted to have, of course, the best possible fighter for Finland. But that was a major investment, and it shows that uh, Finland is actually really uh, uh, investing heavily in the armed forces, and, and we continue to do so because we have always uh, thought that uh, uh, in case uh, things like we have now seen happen, we have to be ready, we have to have strong national defense. Uh, then still on the NATO side, I have to say that uh, Finland is, and our armed forces are fully NATO capable, NATO sort of interoperable. It means that, uh, uh, technically speaking, we could uh, plug in and play uh, right now. So Finland fulfills the NATO standards. There's not no uh, no sort of uh, obstacle or hurdle uh, in that sense. So Finnish armed forces are fully NATO capable and fully NATO sort of compatible uh, immediately, if so so is, is decided. 
And Ambassador, I'm, I'm curious to get your take on um, the argument that I've heard in Europe um, to some extent, uh, in Washington here as well, from some former officials from the think tank community that NATO's post Cold War expansion in the late 90s and the, the early aughts antagonized Russia. No one is saying that it, it justifies the invasion of Ukraine that we're saying we're seeing now, of course, but that it was an unnecessary uh, a step that potentially uh, fueled the, the uh, fan the, the flames of this conflict. What's your take on that? Uh, I'm more of the opinion that um, um, there are some rather deep forces in, in, in Russian way of thinking, geopolitical thinking that are at play. I think uh, I don't want to sound too cynical, but uh, a reaction against um, uh, what happened. I mean, it, we might have seen it in any case. So I think uh, obviously you can argue that NATO enlargement has contributed to the Russian way of thinking and behavior. But at the same time, one has to say that um, NATO is not an organization that tries to kind of uh, push anyone in or pull in. Uh, I think it's, it's totally voluntary. Nobody is pushing or pulling Finland in. Uh, I think these countries that joined NATO uh, in the 90s and early 2000s, I think they they basically uh, had a rather fresh memory of of the Cold War and, and being part of the Warsaw Pact. And I think they um, they kind of felt that uh, that um, this kind of a situation when Russia wants to renegotiate the the solution or the end of the Cold War, that that day might come and they might be better off uh, as a part of the alliance. So to sum it up, I, I sense that um, um, although NATO enlargement may have been a factor, at least in the political debate, I'm afraid there are some deeper forces uh, at play here. And, uh, and should these countries uh, not be a member of NATO, I don't know if the situation would be any better uh, right now. I think we might even have a more uh, difficult situation. Uh, obviously, uh, we don't know that because we can't kind of rewind history back and, and then uh, run it again. Um, this is, of course, all, all speculation right now. Well, Ambassador, I want to probe, you, probe a little bit more on those deeper forces that you mentioned based on your time as Finland's ambassador in Moscow. Uh, as we said earlier, you spent a considerable amount of time with President Putin. But I'd like to ask you, are you concerned about President Putin's state of mind at this point? There's been a lot of speculation here in the United States about his access to accurate information, about the isolation that he apparently has embraced during COVID. Um, what do you make of that? And how seriously should we take the, the possibility that he's no longer a rational actor? I think it's, um, um, if I look at the decisions made by Russia, recently the invasion and so on. I think, um, of course, you, you may have to ask these questions because uh, as we see it, the decisions made by Russia now recently, they are basically bringing or contributing to a totally different results that, uh, than they, that, that what they wanted because uh, now you have a, a war, you have a united uh, Western front with sanctions. Uh, we are seeing already that NATO is increasing its presence in the eastern flank of the alliance. And then you also have uh, countries like Finland and Sweden, which are act actively debating the uh, possibility of joining the alliance. So uh, one has to, of course, ask that how rational are the decisions that basically produce totally opposite results of what you actually had in mind um, initially. Uh, what I see now taking place in Russia, and, and it's, it's been going on for a couple of years, is that uh, there seems to be a kind of a deeply embedded historical vision of, 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 the, of the future of the country. So it's my kind of uh, observation that uh, there is a kind of a desire to turn back the geopolitical clock uh, 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 several decades. And I think um, now we see that you can do that uh, unless you are ready to use massive force, which we are now seeing taking place in Ukraine. So I think there's a this kind of a historical vision idea of of somehow restoring uh, something that was lost, and of course this kind of a vision is is in total conflict with the post Cold War order uh, rules based system that we had in Europe, and I think that's what what is at stake now.
So the, are you saying that you think it's more about restoring Russia's clout on the world stage than it is about NATO enlargement, going back to the previous question? In terms of yeah, I don't, I don't think, willingness to, uh, to, to launch this invasion? Yeah, I don't, I don't see this as a kind of um, uh, NATO issue as such. I think it's more about the kind of a historical uh, idea, what Russia is and what it should be. And, and it's sufficient only to look at what uh, President Putin wrote last summer in his article about Ukraine. There's a lot of emphasis on, on history, about historical explanations, what Russia was, what was the role of Kiev in that old ancient history, things like that. So I didn't find too much about NATO, about the neutral status of Ukraine or anything like that. So what I'm saying is that uh, we are dealing with something deeper than, than simply a, an issue of uh, alliance or, or a foreign policy line of, of, of one particular country, which is Ukraine in this case. That's fascinating, and it sort of gets to uh, what I think everyone in foreign capitals uh, around the world uh, are trying to do right now, with, and is probably impossible, which is getting in Vladimir Putin's head. Um, so uh, we're lucky to have your perspective. And on a related note, I would love for you to talk to us about what you see happening in Russia right now. Obviously, the country is now subject to punishing sanctions. The economy is in free fall. We've seen uh, President Putin take moves to stifle freedom of expression and the press. Um, what is the trajectory you're seeing and what do you think Putin's long term plan is for Russia? I think what we are seeing now is that uh, economically Russia is heading back to the 90s uh, uh, with one major difference. I think even in the 90s, Russia had a lot of goodwill from the international community, including Finland. So everybody tried to help Russia at that point. I don't see that happening now, uh, given the invasion in Ukraine. So that's one thing. Uh, politically or sort of internally, I, I, I see country, unfortunately, uh, heading towards the 30s. And I, I think the uh, comments made by President Putin yesterday uh, were actually quite alarming in the sense that, uh, that uh, they were, at least I saw them as a kind of an attempt to uh, totally carve out any room for dissent, any room for real opposition. Uh, and I think this is, uh, uh, this is basically what I've been expecting to see that Russia is, is domestically also uh, acquiring more uh, uh, even totalitarian uh, features, uh, uh, which, which we also see because increasingly Russians, uh, middle class Russians with uh, some links with the West, um, they are actually leaving, fleeing the country, uh, uh, escaping, trying to find uh, new places to live, uh, at least temporarily to see what happens. So, so many Russians are actually voting with their feet, and and I think it's um, it's it's um, it tells you a lot. Well, we've been watching the negotiations that have been happening between Russian officials and Ukrainian officials. At the same time, there are a number of initiatives that um, have been undertaken by the government of Israel, by Turkey, to potentially establish a, a mediation channel. Um, but what do you think the West should be doing to help facilitate some sort of negotiated settlement to this conflict? Should the West be doing more to provide Putin an off-ramp to resolve this crisis? Well, I think um, uh, obviously it's, it's rational and it's, it's, um, it's good to uh, keep on working in, 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 in order to have those channels. And, and it was also the president of Finland uh, uh, also called Putin last Friday. So we have also played um, some role in, in, in making sure that Putin gets some real information from the other side. And also uh, we have been testing a different, uh, different possibilities for a ceasefire and then later on uh, for a permanent peace. Of course, all of this has been done in, in close coordination with, uh, with the Ukrainians and President Zelensky uh, himself. Uh, I think uh, there are a lot of activities in, in trying to make this happen. And I don't see that, uh, that uh, we have less room for peace because of the lack of those efforts. I think the efforts are there. Uh, perhaps the problem now is that uh, uh, at least I don't see, and, and, and many others don't see, 
how serious um, uh, how seriously the size and, and Russia is 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 um, ready for this kind of a settlement or peace. And then one has to keep in mind that um, um, it's not an easy or kind of a, it's not a, simply a practical issue because uh, um, I think any any anything anything like um, a solution that uh, would uh, kind of uh, violate Ukraine's uh, position as a, as an independent country, sovereign country. Uh, I think that would be rather difficult uh, to see because, uh, as I said in the beginning, this attack and invasion by Russia was totally unprovoked and illegal. So uh, I think it's uh, up to Ukrainians uh, first and foremost, but also uh, uh, bearing the, the the brunt of the fighting uh, that they have to they have to be on the driver's seat to to, to decide what is the good solution for them uh, now and also in the future. So we have to see how serious this is uh, uh, and, and where it leads to. But uh, I think we are not there yet uh, to give any, anything like a kind of a final assessment what, what the solution might look like. Just to, just to drill down on that a little bit more, Ambassador. So do you think that if there was a settlement that recognized, in which Ukraine recognized the Donbass regions as independent and that sort of cemented Crimea status as part of Russia, if the fighting ended in that way, do you think that that would encourage Putin to take those steps in the future? It's hard to see a scenario where he would pull out entirely without being able to claim something. What would you make of some sort of in between a, a resolution like that? Of course, any solution that stops the killing and, and, and protects the people would be good in that sense. but. But at the same time, uh, as I said, uh, I'm a bit skeptical towards kind of an approach that, uh, or kind of a belief that uh, you can actually wrap this up easily, and, and by swapping certain areas and, and by making some certain concessions. Because as I said, um, I see that kind of a rather deep historical drivers are at play, and, and I think uh, it's going to be challenging uh, to have a sustainable solution that actually gives uh, both countries uh, kind of a solution that um, they feel uh, that is in, in full or at least mainly in, in, in correspondent with their interests. Uh, so it, it's going to be harder than, than simply have, having a kind of a uh, so-called easy, easy technical solutions that, uh, that in, entail uh, some of the things that you mentioned. Uh, I, I do fear that it's going to be a bit more complicated. At, at, I have to say that from the Finnish side, um, uh, we had all these situations with the Russians uh, back in the 40s. Uh, we had a peace deal, uh, and then finally at Paris in, in 1947. And uh, actually, that has been a, a really solid basis for the relationship uh, later on. And, and uh, I think it's, uh, uh, that was the achievement uh, we made. But uh, I think it's going to be uh, a bit difficult uh, this time. Ambassador, do you expect President Putin to make a move on another country in Europe? And what sort of scenario would you envision if that were to be the case? I think his, his main focus is on Ukraine now, um, because uh, for the simple fact of, of, of the resources, uh, I, think, uh, I think it's really difficult for Russia now to uh, even uh, achieve their war aims in, in Ukraine without substantially increasing the the assets and forces they have uh, in Ukraine. So I think uh, without a major mobilization, without a major kind of a change in, in how the society is organized, uh, I think it's going to be difficult uh, for Russia to divert resources and assets to, to kind of enlarge, enlarge in the conflict. So um, I would be skeptical that anything like that would happen anytime soon. Uh, and, and obviously, if, if something like that would happen, uh, I think we would have uh, some time um, to, to, to see that and understand that something like that is, is, is foreseeable. Certainly with the troop buildup around Ukraine, I think that uh, would be an indication of perhaps a, a lesser threat to countries in the Baltics um, and in Northern Europe right now. Ambassador, I'd like to move on to energy. Um, can you talk a little bit about 
Finland's energy security and the role in uh, that Russian energy plays in that? And do you think that the European countries can actually wean themselves off of Russian energy in the medium term? I think the European countries are moving away from the Russian energy. I think this is uh, clear. Uh, uh, and I would even say that uh, it's going to happen regardless of what happens now with this peace, uh, potential for peace uh, agreement in Ukraine. I think there is a, a, a more uh, general uh, sense of, of of loss of trust towards Russia. And I, I, I think uh, no country uh, wants to leave its energy policy uh, too dependent on 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 country like Russia, which it is today. I think in in case of so, but I, it has to happen uh, gradually. I don't think it can happen overnight. It's going to take some time. It's going to most likely speed up the green transition we have in in Europe, um, and it's going to have some cost. It's going to be difficult, but that's going to be the direction we are heading for. Uh, as regards Finland, uh, I think um, in energy policy, Finland has also. Like in the defense policy, we have always been careful uh, not ending up in a situation when we would be dependent on Russian energy. Uh, in case of Finland, uh, the use of gas, gas is, uh, natural gas is 2-3% of the energy consumption in our country, so it plays a really minor role. And, and gas, we could actually replace that uh, really fast with some other sources. We just had the fifth nuclear reactor went online uh, actually last week which means that over 90% of the electricity now is emission free. Only that one single reactor covers 14% uh, of the consumption. So we have nuclear, we have hydro, we have increasingly wind, we have uh, uh, sources that uh, actually make us relatively independent in, in energy field. Obviously there is oil, uh, uh, which we have, we have been buying a lot of Russian oil, uh, like basically all the, all the Western countries, uh, I think uh, I saw recently our main oil buyer company Neste already said that they are decreasing the number of Russian oil that we are buying. So, and of course, oil is a global market. I mean, it's a spot market. You you just you can buy it uh, from all different sources. So I, I think uh, Finland is uh, not so vulnerable uh, like like some other countries in Europe. And I think we are we have been on the right track uh, for decades already. Ambassador, I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question, and I'm going to ask you to look in your crystal ball a little bit, so my apologies. But I'm wondering, do you think that the West and the world generally can go back to any sort of normal relationship with Russia, given the severity of this rupture, presuming the, the, the situation in Ukraine is resolved in some way? Can the West, can NATO, European countries, go back to the status quo ex-ante with Russia? As usually diplomats don't give simple answers, but I, I do know. Uh, I think uh, the best possible result we might have is to kind of uh, have a peace agreement that uh, fully protects Ukrainians, Ukraine's sovereignty and independence, and, and, and also protects uh, their rights, uh, the rights of the citizens of Ukraine. Then, uh, if that is achieved, uh, of course, we will have at least some of the sanctions. Uh, I think I expect that they would be discussed, uh, but uh, I think the, we, we can't go back to the situation that was before, because uh, what we have seen since the beginning of this attack is, is simply too much uh, that any kind of trust could be automatically restored, uh, even with the peace in, in, in Ukraine. I think. Uh, this has caused um, a major shift in thinking in Europe, like we see not only in Finland but in, in many other countries. So, I think it's going to have it's going to have a rather permanent uh, impact uh, on on many of us on, on on Europeans as a whole. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Ambassador Hautala, thank you so much for joining us here today on Washington Post Live. Thank you, Missy. It was great to be here. And thank you for joining us here today. I'm Missy Ryan. And to find out more about our upcoming events, please go to WashingtonPostLive.com and register for our upcoming programs. Thank you.